Okay, this lecture is over Module 3 of the Cisco curriculum. Um, as you can see over here to the left, it is entitled Protocols and Models. And 3.0 is the introduction. And we'll start with 3.01, which is why should um, I take the, this module. And basically what we're going to learn about here is protocols and models. Uh, models are a way to represent a network and protocols are sets of rules related to, in this case, of course, networking. Um, what will you learn in this module? Uh, we'll talk about the rules uh, for successful communications. We'll talk about exactly what protocols are. We'll talk about protocol suites, which is just a grouping of related protocols. We'll talk about standards organizations. These are the organizations, groups, that create and update protocols. Uh, we'll talk about reference models. Um, in Cisco classes, we talk about the TCP IP layered model and the OSI layer model. You'll be introduced to those in this chapter. Uh, we talk about um, data encapsulation and decapsulization of data as it travels over the network. And then we'll talk about um, data access, uh, which is how does um, how do networking devices um, interact with the network to send and receive messages. So, um, a lot of modules start with a class activity. Um, even if I am in a, an actual regularly meeting in person class, a lot of times I assign the class activities for you to do individually, uh, which is what I'm going to do here. So look for activity 303 um, to appear in Blackboard soon. Okay. Um, this video is about three minutes and 44 seconds, I believe. I am going to play it because I think it is useful to kind of introduce you to some of the concepts we're going to cover in this chapter and future chapters. Um, they make a comment in the video. They use a lot of terms like IP addresses and uh, maybe MAC addresses and things like that that we haven't covered yet. We'll cover them later in the, this chapter. So it says don't worry about it if you don't understand all the terminology at this point. This is how we see the network. Using topology diagrams, we can see the devices in the network, including end devices, such as desktops and servers, and intermediary devices, such as switches and routers. These diagrams may also contain detailed information about a device, such as the MAC address of the Ethernet and wireless NICs, IP or Internet Protocol address information, default gateway addresses, and addresses for the DNS server. By the way, don't worry about what these terms and addresses mean right now. All of this will be explained throughout this course. This is how we see the network. But how do devices see the network? You can think of it as every device being in its own bubble. The only thing a device knows is its own addressing information. In other words, this is how a device sees the network. It doesn't. So, how does a device know its IP address and what network it belongs to? How does a device know if the destination device that it needs to send information to is on the same network or another network? If the destination is on another network and the information has to travel through intermediary devices, how does the source device know where to send it next? How does the source device know if the information it sent was received or if it needs to resend anything that might not have reached the destination. The answer to all of these questions is protocols, the rules that govern how devices communicate. Most network communications are broken up into smaller data units, which we can refer to as packets. When packets are sent on a network, many protocols are involved to help them reach their final destination, each accomplishing a different task. 
There are protocols such as Ethernet and wireless protocols that physically connect the device to the network. The protocols DHCP and ICMPv6 provide IP addressing information, including IP addressing that tells the device what network it belongs to, the address of the default gateway that tells the device where to send packets that are destined for another network, and the address of the DNS server for when a device knows the domain name of a destination but needs the destination's IP address. For instance, when a user requests a web page from a web server, such as www.example.com, the device asks the DNS server for the IP address of the domain name www.example.com. IP is used to deliver the packet from the source of the information to its final destination, in this case the web server, similar to sending a letter. The web server will then respond back with the requested web page. TCP is a protocol used to guarantee reliability, in other words, to make sure all the information that was sent was received, such as the information that makes up the requested web page. If any of the IP packets don't make it to the destination, TCP resends them. So although we see the network like this, remember, it's a combination of many different protocols that allow devices to really see their place in the network and how to communicate with other devices. OK, moving on to 312. Um, talking about communications fundamentals, starting at the basics, which in the text it says, of course, you need some type of connectivity, whether that be copper cable, fiber optic cable, or wireless connectivity. But in addition to that, we need um, many other rules or, or protocols. We're probably going to talk about 15 or 20 in this chapter, and that's just going to start scratching the surface of the, the many, many, many protocols that are out there. So once we get above the physical layer, that is the physical connections, um, we need to understand the concept of source and destination. Um, the message source, um, sometimes referred to the sender, but most of the time it's just simply referred to as the source. Um, that is the device that is sending a message. The destination, um, sometimes called the receiver, is the network device that the packet is destined for. And then the channel, which we don't necessarily use a lot, is basically talking about the path that the message takes to get from its source um, to its destination. Um, so starting to talk about communications protocol, um, a lot of times the curriculum draws analogies. And a lot of times um, in the beginning, that analogy starts out being person-to-person -person communication. And then later, um, we may talk about sending an actual letter uh, through the, the United States Postal Service. You know, something that you may not do a lot anymore, but it is a good analogy. Uh, to talk about packets and encapsulation. So basically what happened is we have two individuals here. Um, we, we have a, a source, which I believe is, is the female in the picture. Uh, we have a destination, who is the, the guy in the picture. And then uh, we have a message that we're going to send over a channel. And in this case, the channel is free space or the, the air around us. Now unfortunately for some reason um, a few of these animations are real jumpy and, and hard to watch but basically what we're going to have is the girl's going to describe a sunset. So she communicates using words and then the receiver is going to receive that message. Okay, so we're not quite to the point of the picture yet. We're just talking about the very basic communications. Um, the same thing happens in a network. That is, we have a source device, we have a receiving device, we have a message we want to send, and then we have a channel or the, the media that it's going to be uh, sent over. So the packet goes from the laptop to the, the desktop. Um, so 
very analogous to the human communications. Now then, for us to understand the communications, we have to have um, a set of rules. So we'll, we'll jump down to the bottom, the, the bulleted list, and then come back and talk about the graphics. In the case of communicating person to person, we need an identified sender and receiver. Who's going to speak? Who's going to listen? We need a common language. So, for example, if the sender is, quote, transmitting or talking in German, and the receiver does not understand German, then the message is not going to be understood. Uh, there's also a speeding and timing of delivery. In the case of spoken, uh, you know, I've been accused of talking really, really fast. Um, it is possible for somebody to talk so fast that the person listening can't comprehend or understand everything they're saying. Uh, timing of the delivery, the best example I can think of there is basically taking turns. If we talk at the same time, um, there's a good chance we're not going to understand uh, what each other is saying, or at least fully understand. And then there's sometimes confirmations and acknowledgments, like, yes, I heard you, yes, I agree with that. Uh, okay, I've given my opinion, why don't you give your opinion type thing. Um, if we go back to the top, uh, we'll see that we start out with human communication between governed rules. Uh, and then they start cramming words together. Uh, they look like they all of a sudden switch to another language, possibly Italian. Uh, it looks like they have maybe omitted some of the, the punctuation. Um, so that first message is going to be hard for somebody, an English speaker, um, to understand. If we're talking about network protocols, um, we need a networking, I'm sorry, a message encoding. So that is, we need to have a way to convert our message into a digital format that is a bunch of ones and zeros. Uh, we need to format that data and encapsulate it in packets so that it can travel across the network. And then there's going to be some limitations or rules around how big can the message be, uh, when are we allowed to, to send messages, and how is the message going to be delivered, how many receivers are there going to be, uh, is it guaranteed delivery or not. So, in the case of message encoding, uh, this is where we, we have the sunset. So we have the two individuals again, and the female is going to describe the sunset to the male. So she, using words, tells the male about the sunset, and then he hopefully gets some idea of what the sunset looks like. Now, in the case of verbal communications, um, you know, here the, it looks like he sees or imagines the exact same sunset. That's probably not going to be the case in human communications. If we switch over to networks, uh, we're going to encode and encapsulate information about that picture into packets, and then we're going to send many, many packets from the source uh, to the destination. And when all the packets make it there, then we do, in this case, probably have an exact copy of the picture because it was encoded digitally, transmitted, and then decoded um, at the destination. So, I've used the term encapsulation uh, a couple of times. It basically means sticking uh, information inside something else. So here we're going to encapsulate a message, which is actually going to be a letter, inside an envelope. That envelope is going to be our equivalent of a, a packet that's being sent over the network. And you'll notice in one or two animations we've seen so far, they actually have a little envelope that travels over the network. We'll see that throughout the whole curriculum. So here we have the sender and information on where the sender is located. We have the, the destination or the recipient and how to get the message to them. 
Um, so if we play this animation, basically what's going to happen is we have a letter and that is the information we're sending. We encapsulate it inside a packet. The packet has the destination. It has the sender. It has a greeting, which will be related to timing. It has the person's name, that is the recipient. It has the message, which is the body of the letter. And then we sign it so we have information about who the sender is. And then they're using the canceled postmark as the confirmation. So that's our analogy. If we look at the network, um, this is what the, the header looks like of a packet. Uh, we're going to have the source IP, the destination IP. Um, we're going to have a length. We're going to have a version. Um, I haven't talked about it yet, but it either be version 4 or version 6 of the Internet Protocol IP, so IPv4 or IPv6. If I simply say IP, that means it's either irrelevant which one we're talking about, or you can make the assumption that I'm talking about IP version 4. Uh, that's what's been around for decades. Um, as far as the message size, um, in face-to-face -face communications, if we play this animation, you know, th this is a pretty big picture. So, you know, the person is sending it. The person said, I don't understand. So she goes back and describes it again. If we look at the networking analogy, we send information. The packet was garbled, it didn't understand, so it's sent again, or it doesn't receive the packets, and this time the message, in this case the picture, is received correctly. Okay, when we talk about message timing, we're usually talking about the three things listed here in the text. Uh, flow control, as the name implies, controls the flow. So, if somebody's talking too fast, you can say, hey, can you slow down a little? If you're getting too much information and you need to process it or record it, you say, hey, can you stop for a while? <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, can you start again? Uh, response timeout is when you don't get a reply. So, these people are on the phone, and if they say, hey, would you like to go to dinner tonight? and the person never answers, then that's timeout. After a given length of time, uh, the sender is either going to say, hey, I was calling to see if you want to go out to dinner, or they might say, hey, are you there? Hey, if you're talking, I can't hear you. And then access method is basically determines um, the sending of the message. Uh, so if we play this animation, in this case, the people are talking on top of each other, and they're not understanding each other. Okay. Uh, nest, nest, I'm sorry, message delivery options. This basically is how many people are going to get the message. And in the case of IP version 4, we have three types of messages, unicast, multicast, and broadcast. So unicast is one-to-one. -one. Uh, you know, if this guy in the middle's name is Bob, let's say, then the person standing at the front might say, hey, Bob, I've got a message for you. Or, hey, Bob, will you run to the office for me? Uh, <coughs> So that is one-to-one -one communications. Now, the other people standing there may hear the message, but they'll know it's not destined for them because it was not addressed to them. I'm going to slip to, or skip to broadcast. So unicast is one-to-one. -one. Broadcast is one to everybody, except for there, there's, there's kind of a caveat. In the case of networking, it would be everybody on the same network. 
um, in the case, if we assume these are students in a classroom, the broadcast would be to everyone who was in the classroom. Uh, so the teacher may say, okay, um, see you all next class. Don't forget to bring homework three. So that was a message that was intended for every student. So that's a broadcast, one to all. Uh, multicast is one to, to many. Uh, so you are sending a message that is destined to a subset of what's called the broadcast domain, everybody that would receive a broadcast. Um, so I'm not really sure um, how, you know, it might say, hey, all of you all who are graduating this semester, don't forget to fill out your application for graduation. And then presumably the two colored people here uh, that are not ghosted out would be the, the recipients of that. Um, one thing that I'm, I'm sure I probably talked about in chapter one is the representation when you draw a cloud. A cloud means there's networking equipment, devices, wiring, that type of thing within it. And it's irrelevant for the most part exactly what's there. You may call out a, a few different things. Like in my supplemental lecture, uh, you know, I, I listed um, three devices that were in my network cloud. Now there are other things there. There may be other devices that we didn't talk about. Um, one thing here that is kind of new with version 7, but it's a very simple concept, is something called a node icon. So basically what they're doing is they're drawing a circle and saying, hey, this is a node. And basically a node is um, an end user uh, devices. So instead of drawing the computer icons or the cell phone icons like we have been doing, you just draw a circle. So what they're doing is they're showing us again, unicast is one to one, broadcast is one to everybody, again, everybody on our local area network, and then multicast is a subset. So, you know, whatever these computers are that are colored in green are what we intend to send the message to. Uh, 3112 is an understanding, uh, or check your understanding. Of course, you can do that on your own. And we'll move on to 3.2, which is entitled uh, Protocols. So there are different types of protocols. Um, basically, a protocol is a set of rules. Uh, the example I like to use is um, playing a game of soccer. So if we actually all got together and you know, some of you may know how to play soccer, some of you may know some of the rules but are not experts. Some people may not know anything at all about the rules of soccer. But if I brought you a soccer rule book that was written in English, um, you could read it and presumably understand the rules. And then if we had another Cisco networking class in Germany, where presumably most of the students would not speak English, but their teacher gave them a soccer rule book that was written in German. They read it and understand it. We could get together and play a rule of soccer because we have a common set of rules. That's why computer devices and you know companies all around the world make network devices, computers, uh, smartphones, etc. And the reason they can all communicate together is because the manufacturer of those devices followed a very strict uh, well-defined um, set of rules. So, um, network communications protocols. Uh, these may be the, the way we get messages from one point to another, such as the IP protocol, uh, which stands for Internet Work Protocol. Um, there's transmission control protocol that is guaranteed delivery. It makes sure that our message makes it to the destination um, intact. There are applications protocols like HTTP, which is the protocol that talks, tells how a web browser how to talk to a web server and get web pages. And there are thousands, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of other protocols. There are security protocols. Uh, the most common probably being SSL. 
secure socket layer, which was created so that you had secure transactions originally from a web browser to a red web server. For example, if you're entering your credit card information. Um, in the beginning, that would go across the network in clear text, and people would sniff that and steal your credit card number. So they created SSL to make that interaction secure. That same protocol was used for Secure Shell. Um, it replaced Telnet, a way to um, remotely log into remote networking devices or remote computers. The problem with Telnet is your user ID, password, and all the data and the transaction went across the network in clear text. So somebody might be able to sniff or discover or read that. So they came out with SS. H, which is secure uh, shell, um, using SSL to do remote communications. Uh, some applications use TLS to encrypt data. Uh, so that's another way or another security protocol. Uh, we have routing protocols that route data from one location to another. Uh, typically, um, this is more a Cisco 2 or Cisco 3 topic, but you have OSPF, Open um, Shortest Path First, or Border Gateway Protocol. And there's about five or six other protocols that you will learn over the course of the three uh, Cisco courses. And then we have dis service um, discovery protocols. Uh, we'll talk about these two pretty quickly, DHCP, Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. Uh, this is what gives a device when it boots up, if it's using dynamic IP addresses, it gives it the three pieces of information that it needs um, to communicate on the network. If we were meeting in, in class, I would stop and say which are or what. This will be on your first test. And the answer is IP address, subnet mask, and default gateway. Um, you definitely get those from DHCP. You can get many, many other things like DNS servers, time servers, etc. from DHCP. Another one is domain name service. Um, that is what allows you to take a name like Cisco.com and convert it into the IP address so that you can communicate with that server. Or if you have an IP address, you can actually say what is the name associated with this IP address and it will give you that name back. Uh, I'll dive a little more into detail about why DNS came into being the next time we come across uh, DNS. Okay, um, here we have a, a networking or a network picture. We have data we want to send and that data is placed inside or encapsulated within an IP packet. So we have the data we want to send, but then we need to put some stuff in the, the header, which is shown here in purple. Uh, we need addressing. We need to put where the packet is going. And we will also record where the packet came from, so a packet can be sent to us. Uh, at the IP layer, we'll, we'll talk about this in a little more detail later in the chapter, there is no guaranteed delivery. Um, if we want guaranteed in-order delivery, uh, we have to use a protocol on top of IP called TCP, Transmission Control Protocol. Uh, that gives the reliability, that gives us the flow control, and it also has something called sequencing. When we send a message, we break it into many, many small parts, and there's a sequence number that tells what order the packets were sent, and that number is used to make sure they arrive in order, if they don't arrive in order, it can be used to reorder the data so it's intact. Or it can also be used to determine, like if we send one, two, three, and the receiver gets one and three and never gets two, it can um, be used to um, ask for a retransmission or have the message retransmitted. Error detection, we put something called a checksum in the packet which is a number that was calculated based upon the contents in the packet. When it receives, um, when that packet is received at its destination, the same calculation occurs. 
if the, that calculated checksum matches the checksum that's in the packet, then the packet is assumed to be good. If it does not match, then it's assumed to be bad. <coughs> and then finally, what they're calling application interface is making sure that the packet makes it to the right service on, on the end. So if it's HTTP or HTTPS, then it needs to go to the web server, for example. <coughs> Sorry about that. Okay, here they're starting to show some of the protocols that are involved. And what they're showing here is kind of the TCP IP model. Um, here in the middle, we have IP, which is Internet Protocol. That's what allows the packet to get from the source to the destination. Setting on top of that is TCP, which is the guaranteed um, delivery of the packet. <coughs> this layer would be called the network layer. This would call, be called the TCP layer. Um, so that's where the term TCP slash IP gets. If we're talking about networking in its strictest sense, these are the two layers of this layered protocol model that we care about. Uh, down at the bottom, we have Ethernet, which is um, the method of sending ones and zeros over the network. Uh, this is usually called the physical layer. And up here at the top, we have what is normally called the application layer. Um, in this case, at the application layer, we're talking about TCP, I'm sorry, HTTP, which is a web server uh, protocol. So this is our first glance at a layered network model. And in this case, it's um, TCP IP. And you can read the text down here. Uh, that brings us to understanding, uh, checking your understanding. Uh, which you can do on your own, and we'll move on to protocol suites. So as I said earlier, a protocol suite is a group of related uh, protocols. So if we're talking about communicating over an Ethernet network, we'll have a group of protocols that will be involved in this communications. So down here, uh, it's kind of unfortunate that they divided this into to three layers. Um, 111 textbook does this as well. Uh, there are four layers to the TCP IP model. There are seven layers to the OSI model that we'll have to learn. But here they're showing us the physical layer. This is what the message travels over. Then they have something in the middle called the rules layer. This is basically things like use the same language, wait your turn, indicate when you're done, send acknowledgments, etc. And then at the very top we have the message, uh, which in this case is one person asking the other person where is the, the cafe. Um, here we have the TCP IP model, uh, network access, internet, transport, and application layer. And we're showing a bunch of um, protocols that are related. So down at the bottom we have wireless LAN, we have address resolution protocol, and we have Ethernet. Most of the time we're going to be talking about Ethernet and its wiring. At the IP layer we have IP, which is Internet Working Protocol, um, IP version 4, IP version 6, we have ICMP, which is Internet Control Message Protocol, both version 4 and version 6 for that. Uh, there are other languages, um, Apple Talk, AARP, which is really, really, really old. Um, hopefully doesn't exist anymore anywhere. Um, IPX, which is um, Novell Network's implementation of the Internet layer. Uh, Novell Network used to be super, super, super popular. Uh, particularly for file servers, um, that's not so much the, the case anymore. So we'll spend most of our time talking about IP version 4 and IP version 6 and related protocols. If we move up a layer to the transport layer, we have TCP, which is guaranteed in order delivery. Uh, the contrast to that would be UDP, uh, which is 
best effort delivery. We send packets. We hope they make it to the destination. Uh, we hope they make them there in order, but if they don't make it there, no big deal. If they drop a packet or they show up in the wrong order, no big deal. Uh, we still try to process the packet. Um, you know, we have SPX over here in Novell. We have several Appletop protocols, and we have several ISO um, at the transport layer. And then finally, at the application layer, um, we have NDS, which is Novell Network. We have AFP, which is Apple File Protocol. Uh, we so have several ISOs here. And then here we have what we would consider more normal, more common, HTTP, HTTPS, DNS, DHCP, uh, FTP, SFTP, Secure Shell, database servers, um, on and on and on and on, just thousands and thousands of, of protocols um, at the application layer for TCP IP. So here we have an example. Uh, I think this is very similar to what we saw before. Uh, we're using Ethernet, so that's the physical network access layer. Uh, we're sending an IP packet, so at the internet layer we're using IP. At the transport layer, we're using Guaranteed Delivery, TCP, and this is a web page, so at the application layer, we're using HTTP. Uh, this is very common. We spend a lot of time talking about Ethernet, talk a lot of time talking about IP, IP version 6, talking about TCP, we will talk about UDP quite a bit, and then an assortment of applications. Uh, here they have something called a protocol suite or we're talking about protocol suites in more detail. Uh, you know, if we're talking about Ethernet, we may also have wireless LAN, which is a wireless implementation. Uh, we have address resolution protocol that we need to do. Uh, we'll talk about that quite a bit. As far as routing, these are possible routing things that happen at the IP layer. Uh, for sending messages, um, control messages, we have ICMP. Um, and for actually sending messages, we have IP version 4, IP version 6. And if we're mapping between public and private IP addresses, which we haven't talked about yet, uh, for example, private addresses in your home to a single public IP address that is provided by your ISP, that would happen using something called NAT, Network Address Translations. Um, at the transport layer, in the case of TCP IP, we either have TCP or UDP. And then here's some applications. And we see that even within applications, for example, email, it may involve SMTP, POP3, and IMAP. Uh, if we're configuring host, we may have DHCP version 4, version 6, and SLAAC. Um, if we're talking about web pages, we have um, HTTP. We have the secure implementation of that, HTTPS, and then we have application REST because there's really no database or memory built into web page access. So somebody came up with the REST protocol that allows you to give persistence between one transaction and another. Uh, one thing they talk about down here uh, is open standards. An open standard means somebody created this and then released it to the public. Um, all of these that we've talked about up to this point, um, maybe with the exception of Apple Talk and Novell Network, which are no longer around, are uh, open standards. Um, so um, you can read through specifically what these. Um, Protocols do down here at the bottom. We, we talked about them real quick. Uh, we will talk about most of these over and over through, throughout the, the semester. Okay. Um, TCPI communications. So we have this concept of encapsulization. And this is basically the encapsulation of data as we move through the layers of the protocol stack. Um, it is typically adding uh, headers and sometimes trailers. So in the case, if we start here in the middle, we have data that we want to send. 
And based on the diagram right below here, we have a web server talking to a web client. Um, so that means we're talking HTTP or HTTPS, but this would be an HTTP request that we want to send to the web server. So <clears throat> we encapsulate that. Um, um, coming down the protocol stack, the next thing below application is TCP. So we put a TCP header on there, which is going to have um, information about the data we want to send. We then pack that into an IP packet, and then we pack that into an Ethernet frame, and that Ethernet frame is what's transmitted over the network. So we should see this in this animation. So the data is a web page coming back from the web server, so it's actually an HTTP response. Uh, we put a TCP header on it. We then put an IP header on it as it moves through the protocol stack. And then we put an Ethernet header and trailer. The trailer is going to be the checksum for the packet. That is then sent as a string of ones and zeros to the web client, in this case the web browser. So that's what encapsulation is, is sticking one thing inside another. Now then, the reverse process, de-encapsulation, uh, is we have a bunch of ones and zeros coming over the network. We read it. It's the entire Ethernet frame. Uh, we pull the trailer off and the header off, make sure the packet's intact. If it is, we pass it up to the IP layer. The IP layer looks and processes the information and then strips the IP headers off. It's less with a TCP segment. Um, the protocol stack rips the TCP IP information off and then we have data which is an HTTP response in this case that the web browser um, images. So another check your understanding over uh, protocols that we we're talking about. And we'll move on to um, standards organization. So there are a number of organizations that deal with standards. Uh, they're listed here. IEEE is Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineer, um, Internet Engineering Task Force, um, ITU's Europe um, Telecom, ICANN is the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, so things that deal with numbers like IP addresses, port numbers, etc are done via ICAM, um, which is under IANA, the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority. So there are a number of groups that create standards. Um, here they're showing the Internet Society. Um, underneath that's the Architecture Board. <coughs> and when the Architecture Board needs to create a new standard or update a standard, they pass that down uh, to either the the engineering task force or the research task force which creates a steering group and then creates working groups or research groups underneath them to work on the standard. Um, as far as TCP IP, um, a lot of this is done with IANA. I said IP addresses, I said port numbers. Um, also domain names are done by IANA because it says names and numbers. Um, there are communication standards <coughs> which relate to how do you send electrical signals over um, a network. So IEEE, the Electronic Industries Alliance, the telecommunications, uh, those two have combined and often referred to as EA slash TIA. And then the European International Telecommunications Union um, are some of the big people that create and maintain communication standards. Um, here's a lab where you can go out and research um, some of the networking standards. I will be assigning lab 344, so watch for that to appear in Blackboard. Um, also, here's a check your understanding over standards organization, which you can do on your own. Okay. Um,
trying to decide whether to break the lecture at this point or not. I think this one's about 45 minutes. Um, I think this is probably a good breaking point. Um, so I will stop here and then pretty quickly post the second half of this module's lecture.